My name is Eugenio Jaramillo. I know that can be a tongue twister for some of you, but just please call me Gino. How to get Gino? Eugenio is Eugene. Eugene becomes Gene. But the Latins can't say Gene. So it became Gino. You can call me Gino. Okay. I'm wearing this purple outfit for a reason. Test your powers of observation, right? First of all, you saw this here, mm -hmm. right? What is it? It's a squirrel. A purple squirrel. Mm -hmm. And what's on my tie? Purple squirrels. A purple squirrel. Squirrels, right? What is a purple squirrel? It's a term used by recruiters to describe a job candidate that is precisely the right fit for education, experience, and qualifications. The assumption is that the perfect candidate is as rare as a purple squirrel. Hmm. Doesn't exist, right? We get it in our business often that you find somebody and he's a square peg in a round hole. You try to jam it in there, it doesn't work. But I'm here to tell you that I'm your purple squirrel for you, because this is about you. So I have to go into my background to see the match between the audience and the speaker. Mm. And I'll give you that. You guys are honor students, and you have to have a 3.25. Pretty impressive. My GPA as an electrical engineer was 2.65. Yeah, I was a C student. You turned so, out all right. So, <laughs> so I, I commend you guys for being in this. The purpose of this class is to show you how to be a leader. I have done that, both successfully and unsuccessfully. Talk a little bit about entrepreneurship and why I fit, because I have been an entrepreneur, and I'll tell you about those escapades. Some of you want to pursue your own business one day, right? We'll talk a little bit about that. How I became an engineer, we're going to talk about that. And you seem like you want to talk about creating businesses. So let's start way back here in the beginning. I'm going to go out of camera. Seventh grade. I'm a product of the Dade County Public School System in Miami-Dade County. They gave us this booklet one time, and it was called Focus. And in there, it asked you a bunch of questions. What do you like? What do you dislike? Would you like this kind of job? This is what barbers do. This is what electricians do. And I answer all those questions. So go back with me to when you're a seventh grader thinking that. And the results came back about a week later. And it said, you should be an engineer. I was like, man, I'm pretty cool, man. <laughs> engineer? Me? Wow. And then always, mom and dad, at least my generation, you're either going to be an engineer, a doctor, or a lawyer. <laughs> the, the professions that are out there today for you guys are, I can't even say some of the names, you know. The, uh, web this and web that and director of this other thing. They, they didn't exist back then. So mom and dad, you're gonna be an engineer. You're gonna be an engineer, 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 engineer. Boy, they drilled that into me. Okay, so I go into math classes. I'm good at math. I keep progressing in math, get an A in every math class. I have great professors. I got advanced one year, jumped a year. And then, here comes 13th and 14th grade, Miami-Dade Community College. Now it's called Miami-Dade College. And I go there, and you're with me now, right? 18, mm -hmm. 19 years old, you're trying to figure out what to do. You're going to college, I got my first job, and I'm also on the soccer team, trying to figure it out. 
So I saw that there was this office that helps you with career placement and counseling. Let me go there. So I go to the counselor and almost the same thing. They give me that booklet again and I start answering all those questions about what I like, what I don't like, what are similar people, what are dissimilar people. They even had me do some very odd things, which was they pulled out a suitcase and they opened the suitcase and it had all these holes in it and it had these round pegs and I had to put my left hand behind me and I had to move one peg to another hole like this and they were tiny me. I'm like, what is this? So I did it. And then the next thing was you had to take a screw, put a washer on it and then stick that combination into another hole. So I, what was I, getting prepared to be an assembly line worker or something? I don't <laughs> understand this. I finished my battery of tests and questions, and I'm all excited, going back to the counselor to say, counselor, did you figure it out? What am I good at? What should I study? And the lady says, you know, Gene, you could be anything you want. I'm like, oh, I was so disappointed. What do you mean I could do anything I want? I wanted to hear that. I wanted to hear that, yes, engineering was it. That's what I should do because that's what I'm good at. Don't you want to do the things that you're good at? Mm. Yeah. It's like easier when you're good at it. Okay, so I studied more math and I do pre-engineering. Then I had a friend from high school that lived kind of near me in my neighborhood. And he had gone to the University of South Florida in Tampa. And we would write each other. We didn't have email. We didn't have text. <laughs> we didn't have Google. And we would write letters to each other. And he told me one time, hey, come up here, visit me. So I go up and I visit him. Hey, take a look at the campus. Hey, this is pretty cool. It's just far enough away from my parents, but still close enough if I had to come back. And I did that trip many times, a four hour drive. So Jeff convinces me to apply to the College of Engineering, University of South Florida. Great, I'm on my way, engineer. Got accepted to the college. Take my first couple of classes and I failed my first electrical engineering class. Got an F really bad, it's like, ugh, take it again. Okay, take it again, this time focus, sit up front, a student sit up front, I sit up front because I can't hear and I can't see. Great professor, a wonderful professor. He was this uh, Jewish man that he told us jokes, he explained things and in really different terms other than, oh, this is a resistor and this is, this is a capacitor, and this is how you com compute this or that. No, he would go off on different ways of explaining things, and I liked him very much. Well, I aced that class, and that's my junior year. And I go on, and then they go, wait a minute, you're engineering, right? But you've got to take core classes. So all you engineers, you have to take the same core classes. But after you're getting close to the end of your junior year, they say, wait a minute, you're an engineer, but what kind of an engineer do you want to be? You mean there's kinds of engineer? I didn't know that. Electrical engineer, structural engineer, civil engineer, mechanical engineer, industrial engineer. And I heard two, uh, a new one today, oceanographic? Ocean, just mm -hmm. ocean, just ocean. All right, leave the graphic out. Wow, what a decision. Well, I. I like math and I like my electrical engineering professor. Let's go, let's keep going with that. Keep going, right? Some of you, it's kind of ringing a, a tone with you, right? <laughs> Same thing, yeah. right? Then here comes almost graduating, right? And now the companies come to the campus to recruit and you start doing interviews. And then they ask you, well, what kind of an electrical engineer do you want to be? I mean, there's kinds of electrical engineers? Oh my God, man, here the whole time I'm saying engineer, but electrical, now what? Okay, interview with uh, FPNL and 
Bell South at the time, <laughs> and there was uh, in Martin Mar Marietta, uh, there, there was an aviation group, and I ended up with a computer manufacturer in Fort Lauderdale, actually in Sunrise. And I was in awe. Well, you go in there and you see these guys like in white lab coats and there was a computer room that was just futuristic for those days. There was computers in there that were the size of a refrigerator and they were called mini computers. <laughs> Imagine the boards were like 15 by 17 and you unplug the board and it had core memory. So it had magnets in it, right? So I could take that board and take it to another computer, slap it in, and it would still have all the programming in that board. Crazy stuff, right? If you do it today with RAM or ROM, you can't do that, right? <clears throat> so I started there, was in awe. The mini computers were, like I said, the size of a refrigerator. And they're nowhere near as powerful as, as your phone today, right? Or what you have on your laptop. But they were the state of the art back then. And we did a lot of what they call IO devices, input, output. So I'm dating myself again. Some of the input devices were card readers. Hmm. And another one was a line printer. And another one was a mag tape drive. And we built interfaces. So we had the fastest box in the business. And then people had Xerox and other brands of printers and card readers and those things needed to connect to the computer and we made them play. And one day I was there and I was troubleshooting a, a machine. And I opened the door and for some reason I, I decided to climb in it because I, I needed to get to something. And when, when I went in it, my watch touched something and I got zapped. <laughs> I jumped back and it scared the daylights out of me. So I said, this hardware thing, man, God, this is hard. You know, wire wrap boards and wire the, you know, if the little leg is bent, the thing doesn't work. If there's too much humidity, it doesn't work. Too much temperature. No, 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 I can't take all this physics. You know, let, let me go over, all right, let me try firmware, right? So this kind of programming, but it's really hardwired in. Tried that for a little bit, didn't like it. And then I went over to software and I was, creating diagnostics for these big computers now that they were doing. That lasted about five years. I was stuck in a cubicle. <laughs> I didn't have people contact. I'm a big people person, or I became over the years more and more people oriented. So I didn't want to get stuck in a cubicle. Then my dad, got some retirement money, he got some severance pay. My grandfather had some assets in Colombia, and we liquidated all that. And so dad and I and another gentleman, we became partners in a real estate venture. Boy, talk about a complete change. 360. I was the president of the company. We bought, I forget how many acres, but it fit 209 homes. I built 45 homes, I kept five, sold the 40, rented out the five, and then we started on 75 homes. And then the bottom dropped out at that time, it was 1989, because some thieves decided to steal money from the savings and loans, and you guys are too young to know, it was a savings and loan crisis. You guys have seen other crises, but that one was the one that hit me. I had a two and a half million dollar line of credit, and it was closed overnight, so no more developing. Because what I did is you got raw land, it was agricultural land, because it pays low taxes, and then I would plat it. So I got an engineer, and it would lay it out, the roads, how exactly how the lots lay out, and then you bring water, sewer, paving, drainage, telephone, uh, power, uh, cable, all that develops it. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to just develop the land and then sell the lots to different builders. But no, dad wanted to be a builder. He wanted to see a monument there, and so we were building houses. And I wasn't liking it too much because every time I would find a way to save money, dad would find a way to spend more money. Mm -hmm. Oh, you save money there? Oh, look, I want to buy these mailboxes. 
Dad, you can't put mailboxes out in the street. Oh no, but we're gonna put power on this. You can't put power under the sidewalk. It's against the code, it's dangerous. Anyway, we did that for a little while. Economy was really bad. During that time, I became what I call a board panda. And I was seeking more knowledge. And I saw this program at the University of Miami <clears throat> and it was an executive program, MBA. And it was really cool. Now back then, an MBA was like 20 grand. Small money today, but big money back then. They really treated us like royalty. We'd go to one room, they would have all our books and syllabi ready. The professors were all PhDs. They came to our classroom. We had three classes. Every Saturday, I sacrificed two and a quarter years of Saturdays to get my MBA. Uh, it's after I'd worked. The cool thing was, as I took each class, it would open me up and I'd say, oh, wow, marketing. Well, I got to get somebody to market our product. And I did that. And then business law and all the different things. I applied them in our business, so it was great. I was learning at school, but I was applying it at the business. Hmm. So no more real estate development. I have my MBA in hand, I have a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering in the other hand, and I go applying to, to different companies. No, nah, you're overqualified. No, you're too expensive. No, no, I got a bunch of no's. And then finally, I, I need to feed my family, I need to do something. And I ran into a company, you guys probably, maybe somebody in here got suckered in, I mean, probably went into it. And it was, it's called Vector Marketing. And they sell Cutco, the knives. Anybody heard of that? Yeah. You heard about it? You got sucked in. It actually works. It, it's a good program. You get a, a nice one going and, and it, it could work for you. I, so I sold knives. And then I opened a branch office. Now during that transition, I reconnected with some high school buddies and they had a construction company and they were near where I was where we were doing the development and so I'd go over there and see them and steal all their forms and then they'd come over and say hey, you know can you help us with computers I mean they, they were like clueless with computers so they bought a compact remember compact that boxy little suitcase thing had an amber screen about yay big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so one day I go to their house and they, oh yeah, Gino, can you start up our computer? Yeah, yeah, okay, let's look at the instructions. Okay, we're gonna boot the computer. Wow, you know, stick the floppy disk, the big ones, the five and a quarter. Stick the floppy disk and watch the thing, watch the cursor blink and, wow, we're formatting the computer. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, I bought my first Macintosh. <clears throat> it's an Apple Macintosh, a wonderful little machine. I still have it today, from oh, 1984. Wow. Kept it as a relic, it still works, powers up. Great little machine. It's a WYSIWYG interface, right? What you see is what you get. With a printer, I gave up that physical, electrical engineering aspect when I figured out the physics was just so intense that I said, I don't need to figure out how this thing works. I need to use it as a tool, right? It's like the telephone. You don't need to know how the telephone works. You just pick it up and make the call. That's all I could do back then, call. Uh, today, obviously, you can do way more with your phone. So I started using these things as a tool, and the Mac was awesome. I used to help them with their first, when you do real estate development, you have to have these uh, draws, they're called. That's how you get money from the bank. And you had to give them these things called releases. So you, you did some money, you paid some people to do a certain aspect, and then they would give you what's called a release of lien so that the property would never be encumbered in the future because you paid all these material money. And I made those lists for them, and it was on Lotus 1, 2, 3, okay? I don't know if you guys even know that. That's the <laughs> precursor to Excel. <laughs> and it was like command this and command slash that. I mean, there was no mouse. It wasn't, it wasn't a beautiful interface. It was some tough rolling. I tell you about them because I actually ended up hiring them 
to build four of the shells, you know, the block and the, the, the uh, trusses, the roof, so I'd get a shell and then I would do the finishes. They built four homes for me. And then after the selling of the knives, and I, I had a branch office, I actually taught college students how to do the program. In life, sometimes it's not what you know, but who you know. And at the time, this is kind of a funky connection with here, my brother played football at University of Miami. And he was a walk-on. He was a second string linebacker, but he was a first string long snapper under Howard Snellenberger, your ex-coach here, right? And Howard decided, oh, he's done with UM, and he's gonna go to the University of Louisville. He goes to Louisville, and he drags my brother over there as a graduate assistant coach. And that relationship builds, and there was a guy who was the kicker for UM. His name was, they called him Flea. It's just a little tiny guy, but he was a kicker and he was really good, Jeff Davis. Well, he knew somebody, and it was this family that used to own furniture stores, but then they created this thing called Checkers. How many of you heard Checkers? <laughs> yeah. Right, the double drive-through yeah. with the black and white, right, fast food. <clears throat> well, I brought the first one to Miami. It's still there on Bird Road and 107th Avenue. And you had to buy the, the whole setup, train everybody. You know, I was there flipping burgers, <laughs> counting money, yeah. making shakes. Mm -hmm. Did that for a little while. Then after the knife thing failed and the checkers, nobody would loan me money. I know that's one of the questions you guys have. Restaurants are one of the most riskiest business. So nobody believed the idea. Now there's Whole bunch of checkers everywhere right yeah. so my good friend that I knew from high school president of the company that I now work for goes are you done with that stuff you done selling knives you done with checkers okay come work for me I go, yeah but I don't really know your business you're a commercial contractor you do all these government projects I don't know anything about that he goes, don't worry don't worry we'll train you we'll train you come work for me Okay, so I start working and I do office management stuff. I do some estimating and then I finally go out to the field. I become a project engineer. Then I was a project manager and I got more and more levels of charges and that's a successful part of the story. But the other parts were the failures and it's okay to fail. That's my message you, to you today, that everything's gonna be okay. It's okay. You just got to go through the process and go through each step. Now, one of the things I'll tell you about college, don't linger in college. <laughs> Take your classes, enjoy them, go to the football games, but get your degree and get out. The longer you wait, the more the requirements change. And then you've got that one class that, oh, senior, I got to take. Oh, but they don't offer that till next fall. Oh, has that happened to you already? <laughs> right? I'm uh, hearing the, the yaws. So I failed at all those things, right? About the hamburger place, the knives, the real estate development. And I finally found my, my deal in, in the construction business. And I went through many roles and finally ended up at Miami International Airport where we built close to half a billion dollars worth of work there. I'm very proud of that terminal, the North Terminal. Mm -hmm. And I've been all over that horseshoe building projects. I know that place backwards and forwards. I was there 17 years and then I retired. I said, you know what? Life is too short. You gotta do the things that you wanna do and live really live. I was not too happy at the time. I, my natural progression of positions, I wanted to be the director of general construction. They got another guy and they made me, I tell a joke about this, that they demoted me to CAO. I was a chief administrative officer. 
and I was in charge of a bunch of acronyms. HR, Human Resources, IT, QC, Quality Control, and S-A-F-E-T-Y. Well, I know that spells safety, but it really means some asinine fellow employee training yaks. It was crazy. <laughs> I'm watching a bunch of people. I, I didn't have a budget. I didn't have plans. I didn't have specifications. I didn't have a contract. I didn't have a schedule. I failed miserably. Eh, not really. I trained a whole bunch of people and spent their money, but it was not my deal. So I said 59 and a half, and I had written it down on my 55th birthday. At 59 and a half, I am retiring. I don't care what, what's going on. And I did that. Why did I pick 59 and a half? Because that's when you can take the money out of the 401k without a 10% penalty. <laughs> Yay, IRS, go away. So I took it over to a self-directed IRA, and I'm also part owner today of a registered investment advisor. Now, we're not like Bernie Madoff, where you give us all your money, and then we go wild with it. <laughs> Ponzi scheme, no, you keep your money in your bank, in your accounts, and we have professional managers, that have, that's what they do, they're money managers. They tell you where to, where to put it, but they do it for me. I don't even, they don't even ask me. It's just, you know, so much in bonds, so much in stocks, mutual funds, ETFs. So my money is safe there and it's growing and, and they take care of that for me. So when I retired, I needed something to do and I became a found object artist. Kind of a crazy thing. And I opened my own gallery and studio in Doral with three goals in mind. One was to create a Doral art district because that's where I live. I didn't want to drive to Wynwood and pay <laughs> or I didn't want to go to Bird Road and the different art districts. So I wanted to create my own in my own backyard. And then I had a pretty big space. It was 1,200 square feet. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna give other artists a chance to display their art in my gallery. And I did that. And every month I would have an opening and the third one was to create, create, create. Man, once I turn that switch on, I can't turn it off. I gave her a little present. I know she took it with her. Uh, I brought a little sample. It's a tiny little thing. It's, a, it's made out of wire. Most of my work has wire in it. Electrical engineer, wire. <laughs> kind of goes together. It's, a, it's telephone wire, mainly, from Miami International Airport. You know, we got all these telecom rooms and the wire gets pulled and now it's being replaced by fiber optic. And show, show them the little tree. So it's, it's a little wire tree that I made. So I did all those things and here I am. And I'm here to pass on my knowledge, to share it with you, to help you in your path. And I got a little story about the it's okay. When I was 18 years old, is anybody 18 in here? You're 18 years old? You're 18 years old? In each leg. <laughs> when I was 18, you know, I was playing soccer, I was in Miami Dade, I was working at Baptist Hospital. I would come home late at night, and I would get in my bed, and I would cry. Why am I crying? Dad would come over and say, why are you crying? What's wrong with you? And I couldn't answer. I didn't know. But now that I reflect and go back, felt overwhelmed, I think is what it was, right? The high school was so protective, playing soccer, going to class, mom took you to school, but then you're out, you're on your own, you have to pay your car bill, your insurance bill, you take care of your own finances. But then about 10 years later, I saw a photograph. Now this is my mind going back. And the photograph had me standing behind a really pretty chair that we had. It was a hand-painted chair. And I had my wife, first one, it's number three. <laughs> so the first wife is there sitting with my beautiful, bouncing, blue-eyed, blonde baby boy on her lap. My six-year-old daughter standing in front of her. And I saw that picture. I'm gonna get a little emotional. <laughs> because, I cried when I was 18, so stupid. Had I known 
that 10 years later I'd be married and have two beautiful children, a beautiful wife and a beautiful home, it'd be okay. Everything's gonna be okay. These are all the things that you do and weave into your life so that you become whoever you become. And it's okay to graduate as an electrical engineer and do something else. And I'm gonna segue a little bit to a question that it, I saw two versions of it. When should you get your MBA? Should you get your MBA? Is it worth to get your MBA? My opinion on the MBA is it's a worthy degree. However, if you're just coming out of school, wait. Give yourself five, six years. Heck, <coughs> maybe there's an employer that'll pay for it. You know, right now the FIU, I saw the flavors and there you got a $35,000 flavor, a 55, a 75. So it's no chump change. And then they throw stuff in there like a trip to Dubai and a trip to Japan and a trip down to Hawks K and the Keys. So you have to be cautious about it. It is worthy. Now, some of you also think about getting a master's in something, but here's the deal. If you go and become that electrical engineer, work for somebody or a computer scientist, what if you don't like that job? What if you don't like the people? What if you don't like the things that you do there? It's okay to change. It's okay to reinvent yourself and be something else. You saw my reinventions. Some of them were reactive and some were proactive. I wanted to be these things. So that's my answer on the MBA. Wait, see if somebody else will pay for it, right? What happens if you work for a really big firm and they have these programs? They have a career development program or a personal development program. Maybe they pay for your tuition. And then you'll be a lot more mature. <clears throat> when we talked about my GPA early. Yeah. You guys are 325 or more. That was a 265. Well, in my MBA, that was a 3.495. I was into it. I, I liked it. I had other professionals with me. So you're more mature. You're more likely to draw more benefits out. Okay? So during this whole span, I realized that there's things that they don't teach you in school. And I'm gonna limit it to five of them. There's five things I feel the schools are not doing students a service by not teaching these things. But I'll give you a little quote first on the first topic, which is public speaking. And that was one of the questions. What's Toastmasters done for me? You can't outsource public speaking I'll say it again, you can't outsource public speaking, right? You can't get on the computer and get somebody in India. As an entrepreneur, it's up to you to be the face of your business. This was said by Alison Shapira, she's the founder and CEO of Global Public Speaking. Warren Buffett, you guys know Warren Buffett? Mm -hmm. Or Char yeah. Hathaway? His stock price, I looked it up today, is $217,000 a share. So he's got one heck of a company. And he says, the number one skill that you can procure, attain, or teach yourself is public speaking. How many of you think that I'm a natural pub public speaker? Like I was born to do this, I'm a natural, I'm kind of gloating on myself, I'm funny, <laughs> I'm prepared, no. This is practice. Practice, practice, practice. Right? It's like going to the gym, right? Mm -hmm. That's how you get big muscles. You don't go to the gym one time, lift a bunch of weights, go home, oh man, my muscles hurt. You gotta practice. Mm -hmm. People are terrified of public speaking. Anybody relate with that? In the front of a crowd, mm -hmm. <laughs> opening up yourself. <clears throat> they don't know what you're thinking should comfort you a little bit. In fact, Jerry Seinfeld has a little skit that he does on this. He says, people are so terrified of public speaking, it's number one fear. 
Number two is death. <laughs> so he says, be careful if you go to a funeral because would you prefer to give the eulogy or be in the casket? <laughs> Right? There's a huge fear of public speaking. How do you remove it? Practice. And one class doesn't make you a public speaker. No. Right? You say, oh, I'm going to go for a semester, take one class, or go one time. Just, no. It's repetitive. The other thing is that sometimes some of you in high school or maybe even in college, I don't know if it still exists, a debate team. Oh, I'm on the debate team. Oh, yeah, I'm a speaker. Uh, no. Okay. Now you guys have a wonderful, opp wonderful opportunity here. There is a Toastmasters group here at FAU. How many knew that? You guys knew that that's here? Have you guys heard of Toastmasters? Anybody? No. You've heard of it? Okay. It is the largest and oldest organization that you've never heard of. It's in 142 countries. There's 350,000 people involved. There's 15,000 clubs. In fact, between Key West and the Jupiter Inlet, there's 312 Toastmasters clubs. Wow. So there's no excuse for you not to join one. Now what I tell people is that you have to find something that is convenient. Now what does convenient mean? It's close to your house, it's close to your school, it's close to where you work, it's close to where you drive by on your way. You know, you're not gonna drive an hour, right? Because I see the excuses, oh my God, an hour? Nah, now nah, I'm gonna skip it today. And it has to be at a time that's convenient. I go to the one in South Dade and that's from 7.30 to 8.30. So that's some dedication to get up every Wednesday and be there by that time, fight traffic. I also go to one in Doral, it's at 7.20 to 8.30. And you guys have it right here. They meet weekly every Thursday from 5.20 p.m. to 6.20 p.m. All meetings are one hour, chop chop. They start on time, they end on time. They're very regimented. And it's at the FAU House Chambers, I don't know what I'm talking about, Student Activity Center. So look it up. You can go to toastmasters.org, type in the zip code, and it'll spit out all the clubs and the FAU should be in there. Now Toastmasters, what they do is for 20 bucks, you get two manuals. That's the first time you pay 20 bucks. The rest of the time, it's six bucks a month. You guys can afford six bucks a month, right? Skip that one coffee at Starbucks, <laughs> you, you pay for it, okay? So they give you these two manuals. The first one's called Competent Communicator, and it's got 10 sections for speeches. There's 10 speeches in here. The first one's an icebreaker. What's that? That's you. You don't need any notes for that. You get up there and talk for 46 minutes. And you know what's funny is that those 46 minutes will seem like they went like this, because talk you're talking about you. But then when you do the second part of the meeting, which is called table topics or impromptu speaking, <clears> thinking <throat> on your feet, being asked a question, you have no idea. Some of these questions I had no idea, but I'll answer them. And speaking for at least a minute, no more than two. That minute seems like an eternity. <laughs> when they ask you, oh, talk about that whiteboard for a minute. You gotta get creative, you gotta segue, you gotta think on your feet. So it'll teach you to do that. And then the cool part about Toastmasters is that once you give your prepared speech, you will receive a written and verbal evaluation that day. It's there in the manual. There's certain objectives, you have to meet the objectives. You get told what they liked about your speech, what distracted, them from your speech you know say say that I was up here like this like this yeah. I'm wiggling I saw a girl trying to be calm but she was that's distracting and then they'll give you things to improve a way to improve and isn't that what we're all here to do try to improve improve our public speaking skills that's the number one skill you're gonna have to get in front of groups 
You're going to have to pitch your idea. You're going to have to ask for money. So, public speaking, I cannot emphasize it too much. Public speaking leads to the next thing they don't teach you in school, not even college. Leadership. And Toastmasters preaches this. Their tagline says, where leaders are made. Because in order to become a good leader, you have to be a good speaker. And you have to be a good listener. And some of the roles that you do, which is the other manual, this is called the competent leader, there's certain roles that you have to do here. Like we count people's errs and alls. How many of you watch the debates and stuff and you hear, uh, you know, these are our top people and they're having all these errs and odds, kind of distracting. Mm -hmm. We have grammarian, we have a joke master, so you get credit for any one of those roles and they're, they're more and more the, the progressive roles. Here's what Steve Jobs said about leadership. He says that management, how many of you think you're good managers? Nobody? Think you're a good manager? How many of you think you're good leaders? That's more important. He says management is about persuading people to do things that they don't want to do, while leadership is about inspiring people to do things they never thought they could do. And isn't Steve Jobs a perfect example of that? Mm -hmm. That guy used to alter people's reality. So in leadership, it has to do with serving and mentoring others. You should always be teaching the person that is your subordinate, coaching, guiding, teaching, mentoring, how to do your job so that you can step up to the next level. So it's about service to others, being selfless, giving credit to others. I had a guy that said, you know, if everything goes wrong, it's you guys' fault. But if it goes right, I, I take the credit. No, that's not what leaders do. Now here's another one, and you're gonna see it, uh, you can pass some of these out, I don't want you to get distracted, but there's a little bookmark that I created it's a little takeaway that I have for you. And I have this little phrase for you. Leaders are readers. Leaders are readers. You should be reading ebooks, listening to audiobooks, reading a book all the time. You should be working on at least one book every day. Read every day. Whether you read an article on LinkedIn or you something interests you on Facebook, read it, teach yourself. And I did that. I had this terrible, terrible pains in my shoulders. First it started with my left shoulder. It turned out to be this thing called bursitis. You have a little sack here in the corner and it inflames. And what happens to your shoulder is you move it, ah! It hurts, so you don't move it. You move it, oh, and then you don't, and then you get frozen shoulder. You walk around like this because you don't want to move your shoulder. So I went the traditional medicine route on the shoulder. Therapy, all these exercises, hot, cold, they pulled on me, they pushed on me, they did a bunch of stuff, and doctor didn't work, man. He goes, well, you know, we got one more step, and that step is we're gonna give you a shot of cortisone and silicone right in the shoulder. And I sat there in his chair, fingers out the big syringe, and he goes, and he puts it in there. And this is after months of having nine out of 10 pain, being in a bad mood, and I went, oh. I just totally relaxed, and I started laughing. <laughs> And the doctor's like, hey, are you okay? You know, you're not gonna pass out on me? And he said, no, I'm a doctor, thank you so much. What a relief, oh my goodness. About a year later, this one acts up. And I go back to him, I go, doctor, you know what? That thing you did here, need it over here. He goes, no, 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 we can't do that. 
You have to go through the steps. There's contraindications. You have to do the steps. You have to do the therapy. And I said, what? No way. Uh -huh. So one of my bosses loves to get up and exercise. So he got up one morning and he twisted. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, he hurt his back. And he told me about an acupuncturist. And I looked up for the acupuncturist to solve this. And it turned out that I found a totally random acupuncturist, not, not my bosses, but I got turned on to acupuncture. And the acupuncture, acupuncturist was a lady. She was a clinical psychologist, graduated from FIU, but she was a classically trained Chinese acupuncturist. And I told her, doctor, I'm going skiing in three weeks. I need to be good. <laughs> so she was like, okay, you know, these little, they're not needles. They're actually a silver wire. You know, our, our media and our TV and the movies sensationalize everything. You imagine somebody with, what's that, that monster that has all the pins oh, on his face? You, you know where it is. It's not all those pins. You know, she would sit there and she would push on one of my meridians and it unblocks stored energy somewhere and man i got such relief but then she said you know what you know this is good this is working but you need to lose some weight i go okay and this flyer came to my house and it was about a yoga class in my community where i live and it was free i'm already paying an association fee so i'll go check it out and i went and i checked it out and i go every saturday morning it was steady every Saturday morning, sacrificed my Saturday mornings. And I'll go back to her again, and she goes, you know, Gino, you gotta do more than one class. And then I found a class at a local elementary school, and we're doing it Monday and Wednesday. Now Saturday, Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, Monday, Wednesday, yoga, and I used to cry in those classes. I couldn't bend down, my stomach would come up and choke me, and, but I kept at it, I kept at it. And then I became a yoga junkie. I went to yoga everywhere. I went to the beach, to the grove, to the gables, and I really, really enjoyed it. And then one time, one of my teachers kind of tricked me. She goes, come to this class with me over at LA Fitness, and, and you're just gonna adjust, you're just gonna help me. Okay, so I go, and, and she teaches the class at LA Fitness in Doral, and, I adjust some people, yeah. Okay, I'll see you there next week. All right, go there. She goes, oh, Gino, I, I can't make it. Go ahead and teach the class. What? <laughs> this was like a year and a half into it. And I was, like I said, I was a junkie. I read, I, last night I happened to see my stack of yoga books and there's probably 20 on the shelf. <laughs> so I taught myself yoga and I also read five years worth of yoga journal every month and man i was into it and i loved it and it really really helped me out so by reading i was able to teach myself yoga and i was able to teach it to others now i didn't teach yoga to get students i taught yoga to find other teachers because one teacher at a time yoga teachers can make an impact to the world as a matter of fact, one of the guys that became my student, became friends, he's the owner of Palmetto Ford, he opened up a yoga studio in Doral. So that was pretty cool. Leaders are readers. The teacher appears when the student is ready. It's another famous line of mine. What does that one mean? When, when you're searching for knowledge and you're hungry for this stuff, that teacher is going to appear. It could be a book. It could be a class you took. It could be a personal trainer. So the teacher will appear when the student is ready. Here's something by John Maxwell. And he says, you read John Maxwell, the guy's a great business writer. He says, Leadership is not about titles, positions, or flowcharts. He calls it a flowchart. You've heard of it, org chart. Mm -hmm. It's not about that. It's about one life influencing another in a good way.
and John Maxwell has the five le levels of leadership, I leave that as homework for you to study up what it is. You, you'll get your first one. You'll, you'll become a leader within two years of, of you working out in the field, right? Mm -hmm. They'll come to you and say, wow, you know, you're, you're a really good engineer. We want you to be the manager of, of all these others. So you get the title. Mm -hmm. They give you the title right away, that's step one. And then you'll eventually get to the to the five steps, but you're going to get it handed to you. Now, here's the third thing about what's not taught in schools. And I had one finance class in MBA. The subject is called personal finance. Right? How many of you know how to balance your checkbook, pay bills? How many of you look at your credit score? You're cognizant of your credit score. Mm -hmm. You are not living beyond your means. You're not getting into debt. Nobody told me that. Right? Buy that big screen TV, buy that car, go to Europe. So the deal is to stay on a budget. You're going to get budgets in business. Your boss is gonna give you a budget. You better stay on it. Now, what if you're not careful with your own finances? Why should I, as an employer, hire you that are, you're in debt? Do you have a terrible credit rating? You're gonna handle my money, my projects? You have to be responsible with the money, okay? I talk about retirement. I know it's early for you guys, but retirement has the three-legged stool that has always been taught to us, right? You have Social Security, a retirement plan, which these days it's a 401k, if you're a teacher, it's a 401b, and personal savings. Not a lot of us have those three legs. So you have to work on those to get yourself a nice stable stool. But then the stool, the more legs it has, the better. So there's other kinds of income. There's residual income, there's passive income, there's business income. There's whole life insurance where it builds up and you can get a, a cash payment out. So mind your finances. Here's the other thing they don't really teach you. Maybe you do, uh, you're in team sports, but they don't really tell you how to exercise properly. What works for you? What is the thing that's gonna keep you trim and fit besides eating right? You have to exercise. Now I found yoga and I found walking. Walking, especially if you walk amongst trees because the trees are taking in all our carbon dioxide and spitting out the oxygen. That's a good place to walk. And walking is one of the most complete exercises. Your arms are the first thing that comes out of you when you're an embryo. So if you use your arms when you're walking, that's part of the exercise. And it's a, probably the best exercise you could do. Your body, you don't have to go to the gym. With your own body, you can do exercises, right? Push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups. Don't need a gym for that. Don't need to drive anywhere for that. So you can use your own body. The last thing is nutrition. We don't really get taught how to eat properly. And the proper eating is different for each person because we all have different metabolisms, we all have different tastes, likes, dislikes. And I became a vegan for four and a half years. A very difficult thing to do because family, have a Latin family, hey, come over, Thanksgiving, hey, it's the anniversary, hey, it's the birthday, the cakes. And I even found a place that had vegan cakes. And when, when people found out I was a vegan, they were like, what do you eat? Oh my God, you must starve. Don't you need meat? Don't you need protein? Have you seen some of these athletes that are vegans? They're some of the best athletes in the world. They're vegan. They don't need to eat cows or horses or pigs. So people ask me, oh God, what do I eat? And I tell you, it's a lot easier to figure out what not to eat. There's so much variety. You go to Publix, you go to that produce section, how many of you go to the same place every time? Bananas, the apples, 
you get your favorite thing. But what about the variety that's there? The earth is full of this variety. That's what you need to put inside you. Not that stuff in the center aisles of Publix. You know, a lot of people say, oh yeah, you should learn how to read packages. You know, what's it have in it? You know, oh, low sugar, low fat, low this. Uh, what's on a package of a bag of apples? What do you need to read there? Right, so forget all that package stuff. That's 